giant, ancient and enigmatic boxes that have been housed for millennia inside the underground site that we call the Serapium of Saqqara are astonishing achievements. At your first encounter with them, at the first glance you get as a regular person on a modern day tour of Egypt, these resting giants seem almost like just another group of mysterious objects that are attributed to the dynastic Egyptian civilization. A couple of the boxes have hieroglyphs, therefore they must be from ancient Egypt, the mainstream experts and most tour guides will say. And because they have some writing on them, they were obviously manufactured by that civilization, with nothing more than simple primitive hand tools like copper chisels and pounding stones. And they were moved by lots of human willpower and lots of effort. If you take a closer look though, or if you conduct the simplest of logical investigation into these boxes, a quiet sense of awe starts to set in as you realize they are anything but primitive. The closer you look, and the more you consider the achievement that sits in front of you, the mystery and the sense of awe only deepens as more aspects of their true nature are revealed. Eventually, the undeniable reality of what you're looking at forces the veil of hypocrisy and nonsense that is their official explanation to drop away, and it becomes clear that there must be much, much more to their story. These incredible granite boxes stand before us today as verifiable proof of an astonishing level of manufacturing capability that simply must have existed deep in our own past. They show a degree of precision that is only achievable through high technology means. Precision that is literally impossible to achieve by human hands alone. And such a degree of precision that doing so is only ever pursued for functional ends, which belies their labels as bull sarcophagi. These boxes represent pure mastery of stonework and they even show signs of a capability that far exceeds our own ability to work with these materials today in the 21st century. So instead of simply dismissing them as the primitive achievements of a very hard-working ancient civilization, because that's what best fits our current accepted version of history, we should be learning from these boxes, we should be studying them with an open mind, and perhaps unveiling their true function as new knowledge for all of mankind. This is Uncharted X, my name is Ben, and in this video I want to examine these boxes in detail and show you what I think is amazing proof of ancient high technology that undeniably must have existed deep in our own past, I think likely long before the ancient Egyptian civilization even ever emerged from the Stone Age. This is part two of my multi-part series taking a closer look at the Serapium. There's a link to part one down below if you haven't seen it. In this part, I'm going to focus exclusively on the boxes themselves. On my first attempt at making this video, it ended up at over 40 minutes long. There is an awful lot to say about these boxes. I'm going to break this up into multiple sub-chapters, and I will put together a playlist of all of them once it's complete, and maybe even make an entire full-length documentary out of it. So in this part, part 2a, I'll talk about the box types, the stone types, their hardness, and some of the machine tooling marks that are left to us. In part 2b, we'll talk about the quarrying and construction of the boxes. Part 2c is all about the precision aspects of the boxes. In part 2d, we'll talk about the external features, the scoops and the faceting of the boxes and the lids. And then in part 2e, we'll talk about their polishing and their finishing. Then in part 3 and 4, which may end up being a single video, we'll see, I want to take a closer look at the labyrinth system itself, take a look at some of the many contradictions surrounding this site, and then offer up some conclusions as to what I think really happened here. So please make sure to like and subscribe to the channel so you can be notified when I release the next video on this topic. There are several different categories of boxes inside the Serapium. The largest of these, of which there are 18, are the perfectly finished complete boxes that have their lids on them and they are housed in the center of sunken alcoves off the path of the main tunnel. And these are all made from single blocks of extremely hard igneous stone. Now they're not all quite identical, although from at least my measurements the interior spaces seem to be almost identical. They are the most complete and they're perfect in their finish. There are two unfinished boxes and lids that are made from limestone that are housed in smaller alcoves. There is one just absolutely huge and still not quite finished box and its lid. It's probably not finished because it has a large crack in it and it's tucked away in an area that is not normally on display to tourists. You might recognize this as my favorite of all of the boxes in the Serapium. There is also one much smaller box. It's like many of those that are on display in the Egyptian museum or of the type that you would see inside so-called Old Kingdom pyramids. 
This is slightly rounded and it sits at the end of a long single passageway that's cut into the rock. We're not sure if this box was coming or going, but it sits at the entrance to this tunnel today. There's also one unfinished box that sits inside one of the tunnels, which in itself is very interesting. Its lid is lying some distance away near the entrance to the site itself. And then there is also another finished rose granite box. It's one of the largest boxes in the site that sits in another sunken alcove. Its lid is also away from it. It's over near the entrance to the site as well. These couple of lids near the entrance, just by themselves, are absolutely massive. And they can often be mistaken for unfinished boxes in themselves, and that tends to muddy up the count, or at least it's muddied up my count in the past, but there are a total of 24 boxes and lids inside the Serapium. Other than the limestone boxes, all of the boxes that you'll find are made from extremely hard igneous rock. Now, granite's a good overall term for them, but it's not entirely accurate. I've heard them described as granodiorite, or as cyanite, or as cyanite with perforatic diorite. And this, this is black granite? Yeah, this is one of the names that it can be called the black granite. Yeah, one as of the we 300 were, names. One of the 700 <laughs> names. Christine <laughs> Mela was here to tell you the cyanite. Cyanite. I asked our friend and the teacher, Susan Moore, like, what can you call this? What can she said, cyanite with perforatic diorite. <laughs> that sounds more complicated. <laughs> Geologists could likely talk for hours just on the composition of these boxes, but they are all of a similar type of stone. Even granite itself is made up from mostly quartz with feldspar and other types of crystals in the material. And this is the case for most stones of this type and even for limestone. It's a conglomerate of various materials in various concentrations. So what is true for all of these boxes is that they are crystalline in nature and they are made from extremely hard material that is exceptionally difficult to work with. The Mohs scale of mineral hardness is a measure of just how hard a material is, as determined by the ability of other materials to scratch it. So for example, talc is a 1 on the scale, diamond uh, is a 10, your fingernail is around a 2.5. So if you can scratch something with your fingernail, you know it's got a hardness level of less than 2.5. So here's an example of this chart. It's interesting to note where copper, iron, steel, and hardened steel lays on this chart. Marble, as an example, is around a three on the Mohs scale. You can imagine this is probably why it was so attractive for the later Greeks and Romans to use it in their construction. Copper, around a three. Bronze and iron, around a four. Granite, Granodiorite, basalt, all these types of stones, seven and eight on the Mohs scale, incredibly hard material. You'll notice things like corundum are on there as a nine, and it's probably worth mentioning that some of the oldest objects ever found in ancient Egypt are actually made from corundum. There are jars in the Egyptian museum made from corundum. It's, it's an absolute mystery as to how these things were manufactured. In practice, I think what this means is that there is just no way you are working this material with copper chisels and some of the tools that are ascribed to the ancient Egyptian civilization. No matter how many thousands of copper chisels you throw at it, all you're going to do is wear away your copper chisels. And the same holds true for bronze and even iron. Now, I've seen some examples and some experiments that are kind of laughable that suggest using sand or other slurries that typically contain hard elements like corundum and quartz as an abrasive with a copper saw or a copper tool to work through granite. And while this certainly does have an effect over time, I think they were cutting away at a slab for a day or two and managed to penetrate in about an inch into the material. It certainly does not explain the interior cuts in the box, how you empty out the inside of the boxes, how you finish the surface to such an astonishing degree of precision. It doesn't explain how you quarry these large pieces out of the ground. It certainly doesn't scale up. I mean, some of these blocks must have been 13 to 15 feet, and they're positively tiny when you compare them to some of the other single-piece granite artifacts from the so-called Old Kingdom period. Things like single-piece giant statues, huge blocks, as well as obelisks and columns. It certainly does not explain the tool marks that are left to us in certain areas of ancient Egypt. Marks like these ones at Abu Sir that are on top of a large block of basalt that clearly show a very thin but very large circular saw was in action cutting this block. Or marks like these ones 
that are left behind from tube drills that were drilling into very hard material like granite and basalt, also at Abu Sia. But you can find these all over ancient Egypt. Some of the cores from these tube drill holes have been measured and show just an astonishing rate of material penetration and suggest that there were tons and tons of pressure behind this drill tip. Certainly nothing that can be achieved by hand. And indeed the penetration rate is, it exceeds anything that we can do into this type of material today. There are a couple of examples of machining marks and tool marks still on these boxes in the Serapium. What's certainly clear is that they went through several stages of finishing. There was some rough machining that occurred initially. This looks like an unfinished box and it looks like it's the, the Neomelitic type of limestone and it's not polished. So I wonder, were they going to polish it inside here? Where is the space that the workers are going to stand in and they do the polishing? Hmm? There was a very fine smoothing of the surface that took it down to an almost finished state. And then there was the perfect polishing that occurs on these boxes that leaves them with that mirror finish that reflects light. It's absolutely incredible. Now, not all of the surfaces of the box were finished to a mirror finish like this. It seemed like the outside surface of the box, the tops of the lids, and certainly the inside walls of the box itself in particular were finished to an absolutely perfect mirror finish and that has eliminated any trace of any tool marks. But for example, there is some places like the undersides of lids that did not receive this final polishing step. And in these areas, you can see some very fine machining tool marks that was obviously the process used to get it down to this very close finishing stage but not quite the actual mirror polish stage. Here also we have other machining, probably the latest layer. We saw how the rough machining reached a certain point. We have more machining here, look at it here. Fine lines. If you can bring it with your camera. You see there are fine lines. Yeah. You see it? Yes. That looks like the final process or the final stage of smoothing before they give it the shiny polish. There is also an exposed corner on the box with all the writings on it in the lower section of it that looks like a very abrasive tool was used. It was one of the early steps in just forming the shape of the box, but you can see here, it looks like this tool was incredibly powerful in terms of how it just chewed away at the granite. This looks like a machining mark to me. See that down there, the, 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 that's the, the rough machine? The fill, yeah, the rough machine. So we, we do have rough machining and it's still uh, lost to technology. It's highly abrasive, like that looks like it's taken just chunks out. Brrr, brrr. Yeah. That must have been some incredible tool, like just, I can't imagine what the, yeah. how they did this. Hey everyone, Ben here. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Stick with me on this series. I've got quite a lot planned. I've been doing some 3D modeling of the boxes to try and illustrate some of the points as you can see here. Please remember to like and subscribe. And if you think what I'm doing is worth anything at all, please uh, find a way to support me in that value for value model that I'm trying to run here. You can find all the details to support me on unchartedx.com slash support. But think of it as tipping your server or the price of a cup of coffee or something like that. You can drop me a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, something like that in a tip jar just using PayPal. If you think what I'm doing is worthwhile, you can subscribe to support me on Patreon or on Subscribescar. On Patreon or subscribe or <laughs> subscribe star or on subs subscribe star i can't s believe they named it subscribe star it's so difficult to say for these idiots like me that want to say it and i want to say thank you to the couple of people that are already supporting me on patreon it means the world to me so until next time peace